Hey everyone, good afternoon. And thanks for joining us during your lunchtime to talk about the metaverse and NFTs. We have a exciting walkthrough for you. And I hope that most importantly, you're gonna be able to decide no more about NFTs. You're gonna be able to decide what you wanna do with them and then actually take action with some of this information. It's so important that we come together and collaborate as a community. I'm joined here by a number of folks and I'm gonna start us off. Richard, take us right into the technology side. What do you need to know? Justin, the legal side and Broderick's gonna talk about business. So let's get started. The metaverse, what is this thing? How does NFTs come into play and more? Well, we were talking with some friends. Hey, I got one and bought an NFT, wonderful. I also have the same picture on my screen. Great. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference between the picture on the left versus the picture on the right? One is a NFT that could cost $300,000. Another is a screenshot of that NFT. So, you know, you go in and what's the really this all about? I don't see anything different. At the end of the purchase process, I haven't really seen a tremendous difference in, the, in terms of the user engagement, the, the way we could use these things. So the difference in the way non-fungible tokens interact with us needs to be more material. We really need to have more utility value. Helps on the way. The brands have been jumping on this, seen as, as a great way to engage with consumers. Estee Lauder this week was just uh, announced as the exclusive beauty brand for Decentraland, which is a metaverse place that has fashion week. Nike and Mercedes lets you customize their cars and their sneakers and stuff in that metaverse. And here's something a little bit scary. Aren't our kids already using the iPad too often? Well, Gucci and Roblox have gotten together and have set up a world of fashion for kids. Oh my goodness, that's a little bit too early, right? To capture kids into this. But why are brands jumping on this? because they're able to see more data than they ever had before, even with social media. This is like social media plus, right? You look across the various platforms when we had the newspaper, that, that was the way that we could see, hey, this, they received the newspaper. Okay, the website, well, we, they read the content. That was some information. Maybe it was interesting for them. Social media gave us even more about the consumer. Were they engaged? Did they discuss it with people? And the metaverse takes it to a whole new level. Not only do we know, did they purchase this virtual item, but maybe they wore it as well. And in addition, the friends in their circle saw it and maybe commented about it and so much more data. So why is Facebook in this? They've made billions off of social media, right? Why? Because it was all about the timely relevant offer. If I know when and what you need, I can advertise for that and so advertisers depend on Google, Facebook, and others because they have this rich set of data to anticipate what customers need. But then there's a question about the metaverse that we also want to address today, which is scarcity versus abundance. The metaverse, it's a computer. Aren't you just able to, with one click of a, you know, add another bit, which represents a whole piece of land, which represents that Gucci pocketbook? Why would you have to pay for this? So is our whole thinking about the metaverse even on the right track? Why aren't there unlimited products? Why would we need to pay? And why is Decentraland selling land in a place that could have unlimited land? It's like we're taking something that has tremendous, infinite resources and we're squishing it down for some reason. In addition though, it's not necessarily infinite, it's not necessarily all free either, but there certainly are some dreams about what's gonna happen. This is Meta's dream, the view of the, the metaverse, right? Meta, which is Facebook. This is the way they are pushing to us saying, this is the metaverse, this is what it look like. You'll be able to do like a Zoom call like we're doing and plug it right into a beautiful interface here where it's so realistic. Is this real? Not yet. This is the metaverse today. A, a far cry from what we are dreaming about and here's another, that Decentraland, where the uh, whole cosmetic thing is going on. Really very, very different. And even this is challenging for computers around the world to access because of speed. And we'll hear more from the team on that. 
But there are some real impacts here in terms of jobs and business from real architecture to virtual architecture. Those pictures have things and buildings that need to be created. So architects can move from their current role into virtual development as well. And even where they can interact with perhaps where the artist is real, they've created this virtual, and here's a person in some other part of the world looking over the new art that they've put and created, this new building that'll be in the metaverse. Designers, and again, clothing designers, music, they all get a play in this and where NFTs and maybe virtual merchandise can come to life inside of the metaverse as well. And charity even can play a part in this too. So there's opportunities for new jobs, for architects, designers, music makers, NFTs can come alive. You go to a party, you didn't buy the NFT, sorry, no music for you. You're gonna go ahead and buy that non-fungible token, which is like a contract that indicates you have the right to access certain things on there. Wait a second, I mentioned contracts, rights. That means we have new legal needs as well. And so this is our challenge. But there's some new barriers to this too. It's really uncomfortable to sit underneath a virtual reality headset. Your eyes will go wonky, it's hot and, and more. It's not cheap, these are expensive. And then there's security and privacy that are a concern. And so one key thing is that no one company will build the metaverse alone. We're gonna see people collaborate together like we have on the, on the call here today, our creators, our policymakers, entrepreneurs, and more. Uh, Meta sees this, which is Facebook, of course. And I know that after today's call, you're gonna see this. And I hope more importantly, you're gonna see where you can play a part as well. What's so great about this is we have some great, great really good people that are coming here to speak to you. And I'm gonna turn this over to them right away. We've got Richard Cole, who's Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft here in Singapore. And we've been friends, we've done different panels together and I always love to listen to him. I've got my notebook ready. I hope that you do too. Let's listen to Richard as he shares with us about what's coming up together in the metaverse and what, where Microsoft's playing in it. Go ahead, Richard. All right, thank you, Keith. And uh, thanks, thanks for inviting me and thanks to the Smart Nation uh, Singapore organizers uh, for having me. So just give me a second here. I'm just gonna like do the share screen thing and hopefully that comes up well. And let me know if it uh, pops. I can see your screen, yes. Okay, everything is working well. All right, so so first of all, thank you so much uh, for for taking your time during your lunchtime to um, to, to participate in this uh, this very fascinating event um, as we talk about some very interesting uh, topics that has been uh, bented about in the industry um, with regards to uh, the metaverse itself. So my name is Richard Ko. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Microsoft Singapore. A little bit about myself. Um, you know, I I, I always uh, count myself very lucky and very blessed to be able to kind of go into this kind of first two waves of the technology shifts. Uh, whether it was the internet when I was still an undergraduate at the National U University of Singapore uh, as a computer science undergraduate, and then later on um, in the um, cloud computing world when I was in Redmond, Washington as part of the founding team for the product at Microsoft called Office 365. And then now we get to um, talk about the metaverse. So I I'm going to try and uh, just share some perspective and, um, you know, happy to really engage with this crowd to think about, um, yeah, what, what, this all, what this all means to us. I, and I think this conversation is going to be important. But before I do that, let me just roll a quick video. Metaverse. You've probably started to hear this word being thrown around lately. If you're lost, you're in the right place. Here we'll try to answer some big questions from Microsoft's point of view. What is a metaverse? Does it already exist? And are you already in it? Let's dig in. Simply put, a metaverse is a digital space inhabited by digital representations of people, places, and things. Think of it like a new version, or maybe a new vision, of the internet. Many people talk about the internet as a place. Now we can actually go into that place to communicate, share, and work with others. 
It's an internet that you can actually interact with, like we do in the physical world. And it's not just a vision anymore, right? Right now you can go to a concert and experience a show with other real people inside a video game. You can walk a factory floor from your own home. You can join a meeting remotely, but be in the room to collaborate with your coworkers. Those are metaverses, and the future is already here. Now, I can already hear some skepticism, but an avatar of me isn't me. My digital self is not my physical self. Well, that is technically true, but Microsoft is working to help you better represent your whole self in the digital space, while also ensuring that you can bring your humanity and your agency over that representation with you. If the past few years have taught us anything, it's that we need that flexibility. The world has never been more connected, but lately we've often needed to distance ourselves physically. The closer we can reflect our physical selves in the digital realm, the more these barriers we can break down. Teammates can join meetings from anywhere. Real-time translation allows people from diverse cultures to collaborate in real time. This is what takes this from a cool idea to a critical one. The metaverse has the ability to stretch us beyond the barriers and limitations of the physical world. All right, so let's let's kick off by starting like you know with with what we do not know. I, I think this uh, industry buzzword is seeing like massive massive growth and investments, and and I think. It's, it's very interesting when you think about, you know, what's like the metaverse itself and, and, you know, which is perhaps some utopian or dystopian version of Ready Player One. And this upgraded world wide web that's built entirely on a blockchain called Web3, or the blockchain enable art uh, movement driven, uh, you know, by NFTs. And, and we all talk about that. And uh, Keith went into that a little bit earlier on, which is really interesting. And, and I think, What's, what's interesting here is what do we think we know, but um, we'll most likely be super wrong about. I think these concepts right now are still technically quite embryonic uh, in nature and in terms of their adoption. But although it's, it's trendy, I, I think it's still largely unclear. And, and the industry and the community, it's all coming together to really discuss and really work on this together. I, I, I like that quote from Meta where they talked about like this is not one company, we're not one organization that's going to build a metaverse, but uh, really takes a lot of collaborators, creators, uh, different organizations uh, to come together to think about what this might, what this might be. So, what do we like really know about this? I, I think the 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 last holdouts of the analog world is becoming more and more digitized workplaces, uh, training and operations using digital interfaces you know, sensors, uh, driving deeply informed decisions itself. And, and we know that there are already plenty of platforms that are built for one industry and used by many. And, and these cross-industry solutions are not only driving higher ROIs, but also enabling a, a whole world of collected databases, if you will. So, and, and we also know that the creator community has never felt stronger. And there's been plenty and plenty of companies that are looking to contribute to this trend. But, but we, if we lean in into the art of the moonshot here and, and you know, let's, let's define a little bit and see how close we are to this, you know, this sense of the metaverse itself. I, I thought I'd share some of the readings that uh, you know, we've been gathering around um, you know, the web and uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, participations from, from everyone in terms of um, what, what it looks like. And, and I thought this is something that's interesting. Um, I, I put it out here, there's a QR code, you can scan for the, scan for the, the article itself. But I, I thought these are some of the good rules, if you will, uh, to think about when um, you know, discussions around the metaverse is, is, being, um, is being thrown around. And, and I think, a lot of times um, when I get into discussions with organizations, customers, all of that, it's really around things like foundations. What are the foundations of the metaverse? What are the use cases, for example, that looks like that? And, and again, you know, this is, this is something that, um, this is something I want to share. I, I think what's really interesting is that uh, when we think about um, 
the, the virtual environment itself and, and this whole ecosystems that comes together. I think when we think about our physical and biological space itself, we depend on a certain level of safety and privacy and all of that um, to be able to conduct our lives uh, in this space. Now, would that be that expectation in the virtual, in the metaverse itself? And, and what are some of those uh, use cases that perhaps some of those fundamental human, human rights um, gets, gets protected as well? So whether it be it in a, um, in a immersive video game, for example, or a virtual travel and tourism type of setting, these are some of the considerations that is really critical for us as as the planet to be able to think about um, what this uh, metaverse is gonna look like for us going into the future. Now, if, if we think about the metaverse being kind of built on the foundation of the internet itself, then, then let's, let's think about um, how do we been using the internet? Whether is it searching for information, social interactions, um, or, or maybe um, for entertainment purposes, um, make and spend money, for example. Uh, uh, these are some of that experiences of that we have been leveraging the internet for. And certainly over the last two years of the pandemic, it has been a very big feature in many of our lives in one way or another. So um, I think while it's, while it's really engaging in that sense, I think perhaps it's due for an upgrade in terms of its interactivity. So um, what is really exciting is that when we think about uh, some of these understanding itself, it's really like, um, what is this going to be? A new UX and, and spatial uh, computing becomes a lot more important. That synthetic environment that's being created itself. New development uh, environments and engines, for example, and and most of all, I, I think in the space of N NFTs, for example, this new economy that is being sprung up um, as, 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 uh, as the industry and as everybody come together to discuss and work on some of the possibility in this space. Now, um, from a technology stack perspective, I, I've, I've come from the cloud computing environment. I firmly believe that this has enabled a lot of these possibilities and it's gonna power um, a lot of these developments going forward itself, whether is it advancement in AI, ML, or um, the kind of collaboration uh, technologies that enable us to use our identities or maybe sometimes creating a, a pseudo virtual identity itself to be able to interact online, let's say, for example, in a gaming world. And I want to bring up this example around the gaming world. Now, I have two teenage kids, right? One of them, he's a Activision Blizzard Overwatch tournament champion. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and I have got to tell myself to have a growth mindset around this. And it's very interesting as I, as I look at him um, spend a lot more time um, online than in the physical world. It's amazing what this community is coming together to do. And uh, I hope it's not at the expense of his grades, but um, I want to talk a little bit about some of these um, gaming environment itself. I think we are talking about massive scalable infrastructure and this living and breathing world runs on live data. There's a lot of complex neural nets uh, creating really realistic digital mirrors in, in some ways of human behaviors as well. So. I'm sure for, for audiences here who have uh, kids, I'm sure these are games that is not uh, unfamiliar with them. And when you think about just the amount of time um, and the number of kids that, for example, plays Fortnite, oh my gosh, it's just more than the number of kids that plays football and basketball itself. So, and, and to take it to another realm, there is also something, you know, we, we'd like to term it a serious game. There are things like training, there are synthetic environments for simulations and all of that. These are all perhaps some of that applications when we think about that metaverse type of environment where different collaborators can come together to really interact and uh, solve problems, for example. Now, and I talk about our attention shifting from physical to digital, as you can see, as you know, we evolve through the different technologies itself. Just the sheer amount of 
attention span that is spent um, on in the world itself and with all the different devices, you can see that there is a shift. So how do we think about uh, this shift itself? And um, yeah, I like uh, what, what Keith had mentioned in terms of um, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, cost to it, that digital image of that board ape uh, art that uh, somebody just bought, just comparing the prices on this. I'm really looking forward to later on, uh, you know, Brostick, Broderick and Justin's presentations when they talk about some of these, some of these interesting developments as well. And just like the, the, the physical and the biological representations of ourselves, we are also building that kind of digital representations that we are wanting to put in front uh, in the virtual world, in the metaverse itself. Um, but last but not least, I, I think the, the point that uh, you know, Keith brought up around privacy, around security is something that as a company at Microsoft, we really think deeply about. And I think this is a very, very important foundation. If we were to build this, this world itself, I think it's very important that we think about security and privacy. And what I really encourage you to do is to you know, scan this QR code, look at an article. It was just published yesterday. Um, by the leader of our security business when we think about what the security, securing the metaverse um, really means. And I, I think with that, um, I would really like to, um, again, encourage more of that questions, more of that discussions. I think we are still at a very embryonic stage of uh, this, this technological development itself. And I want to leave you with this video to let you get a sense of where Microsoft is investing into. Connection is a spark that gives our lives meaning. It drives us to seek out others who feel the same way. Okay, why don't you input the data and we'll take a look together. Hey, Mari, what you got for me? To find those who share our views, yet offer different perspectives. Saw this net. Look over here. Challenge us with new ways of seeing. But I think we should deepen our understanding and enrich our lives. Great things happen when we commit to something bigger than ourselves. Let's take a closer look at it. Place this here. Let's see how we go from there, okay? This sense of collaboration and the feelings of connection it brings excites us. Hey, just in time. I'm gonna move it slightly, okay? It's yours, take it. We have two planes right now on the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Asia, what do you think? I think we had 330, maintaining 2800. We'll be clear for approach. Excellent. This changes the way we see the world, and in turn, changes the world we see. These numbers are looking great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities, and what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job. A lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent. Slowly bring A world where technology enhances, not limits, humanity. With people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future is here. And here can be anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh. that thank you so much for your attention and i will hand it over back to i guess back to you keith thanks a lot richard wow some really good things to think about there there is a question here for you that i just want to address right away um edric asked if no one controls the metaverse how do we prevent it from getting out of control that's a very philosophical question but uh what do you think 
You know what? Uh, it, it's it's a great question, and I almost feel like I want to punt it to Justin. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I think I think this this is a time where um, you know society as a whole, when we think about the the kind of um, you know discussion and and feedback that needs to happen <clears throat> from the community, is really important. I think from a government regulation standpoint, this is always a challenge in terms of uh, catching up to technology as well. But certainly, I think the, the broadness of the nature in terms of the discussions that we're having is super, super healthy. And at this point in time, I don't think that's a clear answer. But uh, if we stop discussing and, and not do anything about it, I think that will be the downfall of, of any potential that we can we can see in this space. So certainly I think um, the important thing is that continuing the discussions across many different organizations, stakeholders, I think that will be a very important factor for us to hopefully get this right. Fantastic, thank you, Richard. I think that really does hit the mark here and why we're getting together today to make sure that we get discussions going. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Justin, who's gonna join us here and just going to spotlight him here. Justin, are you, you're there, right? Fantastic. Okay, so Justin is with Raja and Tan, the largest law firm in Southeast Asia with 800 plus lawyers, and they cover all different aspects of business law. Uh, he's a senior associate there and follows the technology, media, and telecommunications. Really great to have you here, Justin. And maybe at some point, if it's right, you'll pick up on that question too about controlling it. Justin, over to you. All right, thanks so much, Chief. Um, so yeah, as a lawyer on today's panel, and I guess it's only natural that, that I cover the legal aspects of the metaverse and as well as NFTs. Um, so I think, you know, for my presentation today, I'm not gonna, I, I don't propose to provide all the answers to all the questions that you have. I think given the, the very embryonic um, nature of the metaverse, as Richard said, um, it's only natural that, that there's more questions than, than, than there are answers. So I think what I hope to achieve today is really to, to, to just give you a little bit of a flavor of, of the various legal issues that currently exist, how the laws today are trying to, to, to address these issues, and maybe you know, just, just, just to kind of spotlight one or two particular key issues in terms of uh, the legal concerns that exist today in the metaverse and NFTs. Right. So the question that, that uh, Keith posed to, to, to Richard, I think that is a very apt way for me to begin my presentation, you know, the concept of um, control over the metaverse. Whether, whether, whether control is even a desired thing to begin with, um, if, if, if some of you may be aware, the, the, the central conception of the metaverse in its very earliest days of, the, of, of blockchain as it was first developed, the, the, the impetus for the, for the development of that technology was the idea that, you know, can we take society, can we take money out of the control of centralized bodies such as governments or all over the world? And a, a big part of that is, uh, a big a company concept to that is the, is the idea of anonymity. The idea that on the blockchain, everyone is identified simply by their blockchain wallet code and that wouldn't be a need to identify specifically each individual who's involved there. Um, and I think fundamentally that has created several issues uh, from a legal perspective today. And, and, and that's the first point I wanna to touch on. What role does law have to play in the metaverse today? Um, with that, even, even though that is the core conception, you know, decentralization and anonymity, I think the difficulty being faced today is that the current state of technology is not sufficiently advanced to achieve that lofty goal. Um, the concept of blockchain was, was, was built around the principle that you know, by, by spreading uh, power or control across nodes, across you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of people across the chain, um, you would be protected from bad actors by virtue of the security of that chain itself. Um, unfortunately, the reality today is that the current state of technology is not there yet. Uh, the system is not immune to bad actors. Um, blockchains are not immune to being hacked. Um, the, 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 the transactions on the chain are not, are not immune to being scammed. Um, and as such, there still remains a need for, uh, for a set of centralized rules 
uh, that govern the interactions and transactions between players in the metaverse. Um, if you think about society today, it functions sort of uh, because we all agree that you know, uh, based on the based on the laws of our society of our country, based on certain moral rules we have each other, uh, we interact and 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 we choose not to do certain things to each other uh, based on those rules. Um, and the issue here is that you know the need for these such centralized rules today remains at odds with, with you know the, the concept of decentralization and anonymity uh, in the metaverse. Um, hence the need for law, uh, the continued need for law in the metaverse today. So which leads me to my next point, you know, how are regulators likely to respond uh, and react to the growing and burgeoning development in the metaverse? Um, I think it's quite safe to say that regulators are unlikely to, to, to willingly relinquish their centralized control over such systems, uh, given that you know they still they still uh, re retain a, fun a fundamental duty to, to their citizens, to, to their stakeholders, to, to keep them safe from, from online harms, to keep them safe from various uh, issues that may arise within the metaverse. Um, and they will continue to exert that control based on their national jurisdiction. And I think that is a that is a that is a difficult question to be addressed in the metaverse because you know how do you say which part of the metaverse belongs to which country? Uh, I think I think today there are different countries who are developing their own uh, isolated national metaverses, if you can call it that. Uh, but I think in its truest form, the metaverse is one universe that that, that connects the world, uh, similar to the internet. So what will happen is that jurisdiction will need to be established by where the platforms uh, that, that offer various services on the metaverse are located, as well as where the, where, where the users of the metaverse are located. Um, in terms of the content of the laws itself, the laws will continue to adapt and evolve at the, the same cautious, slow pace that they have. You know, if you're aware, you know, the, 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 the laws today are still actually trying to keep up with the development of the, the internet today. So, the additional challenge of Web 3.0 is an even bigger obstacle for, for regulators and, and, and legislators to, to tackle. Um, what is likely to be the case is that, um, as with all developments, uh, the, the, the courts and the legislators will continue to want to draw parallels between existing laws and new use cases or new situations. So if something looks and smells like something, something online looks and smells like something in the real world, the natural instinct is to use the, the existing laws that govern that real situation to try and apply that to the online situation as well. Um, I think as I will highlight in my next slide, that, that kind of parallel doesn't always work, but that's going to be the instinctive approach. Um, for Singapore, I think the government, um, it's safe to say, will continue to take a pragmatic approach to, 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 to uh, developments in this area as, as it always has. Um, being cautiously open to developments, you know, taking them step by step in, in sort of sandbox environments, uh, while ensuring that the laws continue to develop in a, in a, in a very conservative and pragmatic manner. Right, so which brings me to the next part of my presentation. You know, given, given what I mentioned earlier, that, 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 there are, that the, the metaverse currently uh, may not be sufficiently governed by, by law, um, and it's really somewhat of a wild west. If you, if you follow the news uh, when it comes to metaverse and NFTs and stuff like that, you really hear a lot of like, you know, this, a new story every day. Like, right? There's this hack today, there's this other issue to tomorrow. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to think about really if, if something happens to you in the metaverse, or if you, if you suffer some kind of harm, if you suffer some kind of loss, what rights and remedies could be available to you to address that harm? Right, so some examples would be, for example, if there's a platform hack, um, as I said, no platform today is, is immune to hacking. Um, the issue here is identifying the responsible individuals, right? The, the, the concept of, of, of anonymity is still very real in the internet. Um, when you've been hacked, there's really, there's practically no way of tracing who is the person responsible. So if you can't identify who it is, how do you, how, how do you address that harm against that person directly? Um, when it comes to digital assets, uh, the, the, the idea on the blockchain is that, you know, there's supposed to be a great level of certainty, right, you know, based on the, the transactions there. Uh, but at the same time, those that, that, that can be circumvented, you know, there's, there's things like cryptocurrency mixers, there's, there's things like, you know, taking, the, taking the, 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 the asset off the chain into a different chain. 
Um, and, and there is there are issues when it comes to tracing digital assets. For example, if you suffer the loss uh, of, your, of your cryptocurrency. Um, based on the limited case law so far, Singapore courts have shown that they're really willing to be flexible to some degree to, to try and uh, uh, keep up with these developments. But the, the, the limitations that I mentioned still exist uh, until, the, until further legal developments arrive. Um, when it comes to rug pools, um, if you're familiar with that term, it, it means you know, someone launches an NFT, for example, based on certain promises. You know, if you buy my NFT, I'm going to use the money to do A, B, C, D. I'm, 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 I'm going to develop certain things. I'm going to achieve certain objectives. Um, but when, they, when, when the NFT creator doesn't achieve those things, they think he, if, if he or she takes the money and just disappears, uh, as you may have seen in the news, what can the, the, the persons who are bought into the NFT on the basis of those promises do? Um, could there be a remedy in fraud? Could there be a remedy in breach in contract? Um, the answers to that are not very clear. And I think in particular, one of the main issues is that it's not possible or it's difficult right now to establish really what exactly were the promises or commitments made by the NFT creator when you bought into it. So it becomes a question of proving that, that there were these promises made and they were the basis on which you had bought the NFT and subsequently there was a breach of those promises. I think given how NFTs are structured today, um, there is a real risk that, that you know, these promises and commitments are not very clearly spelled out and they may not be binding on the NFT creator. Um, the next issue I want to touch on is harmful meta acts. So you know, if something, if someone does a harmful act to you in the metaverse, for example, at, uh, one user punches another user uh, in the metaverse, so the avatar punches the other avatar, um, what was the remedy there? Um, I think my view is that existing criminal law is really unlikely to apply, given that there is a, that there's a significant difference in the harm suffered. You, you don't actually suffer any physical bodily harm from that punch, um, although your avatar might, uh, whatever that means. Um, so it, it's probably more likely that, that, that um, the concept of online harassment will be extended to apply to those kind of harmful meta acts. Um, and alternatively, it may be left to the platform to set the, render, the relevant rules of engagement between the users on that platform uh, instead of having state laws apply, or it may be a combination of both. And finally, just very briefly, uh, privacy issues, you know, the, the, as, as, as Richard mentioned, you know, the, 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 the growth of the metaverse really means more and more data being transferred and more and more personal data uh, of individuals being shared amongst different entities globally. Uh, so the, the real question is really, when we grow the metaverse, where is the balance to be struck uh, under the law uh, between the needs of the businesses and the, and the platforms running the metaverse to allow the metaverse to grow organically versus individual privacy rights here? And finally, I just want to touch on the issue of uh, copyright NFTs. So, because I guess this is probably a, a kind of a hot topic nowadays. Um, and judging by the QA that, that we're seeing, uh, it's something that you all are interested in as well. Uh. So, the key conception here is that, that um, NFT, when you buy an NFT, when you own an NFT, um, you, what you are what you're receiving ownership of is really the, the, um, a, a token that, that recognizes your ownership of a digital asset that is stored at a particular online location. But the important distinction here is that that may not uh, result in you owning the copyright in the work itself. So for example, if it's an NFT in a digital artwork, um, there is a big distinction between owning the NFT to the artwork and owning the copyright in the artwork itself. So one, one is that one, one, the, the first one is where you own the token that, that, that symbolizes some, some sort of claim to, to the, the digital asset that's stored in the, in the online location. And, and the second is really the bundle of rights associated with the work itself, that the image itself, the right to, to uh, perform the image, the right to, to distribute the image, to monetize the image. Um, and the thing is that, that people may not be aware is that copyright ownership or a license uh, to that copyright will only pass from the creator to the buyer if it is so specified in the NFT sale terms. Um, the concept of royalties uh, that accrue to, to, to the NFT, that, that can be addressed um, and is quite easily addressed within the smart contract underlying the NFT. But given the, the limitations in the smart contract, which is really, uh, you know, even though it's called a contract, it's not a document with like, you know, lines and lines of, 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 of legal clauses like you think, but it's really a, a set of uh, coded instructions that 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 instruct that there were there were certain effects each time a, a, a transaction is minted on the blockchain. 
Um, so in terms of royalties, it, it, it is easy to deal with that because it's just a matter of transferring the, 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 the cryptocurrency from one wallet to another. But for more nuanced issues such as the, the copy, the, the right to be transferred under the copyright, you know, the right to perform the work, the right to distribute the work, the right to make copies of the work, um, those can't really be captured within the, the, the smart contract itself. So that poses an issue for copyright owners. So, you know, Keith mentioned all the different businesses that are uh, jumping on the NFT train. Um, one issue that, that that one key issue here that they need to be aware of is, you know, if if there's certain valuable copyright in the in the images, in the uh, um, um, or, or, or other works that they are minting into NFTs, how can they bind the NFT purchasers and particularly subsequent purchasers uh, to the copyright terms that they want to impose, you know, to protect the valuable copyright in their in their digital artwork? Um, one way is to is to simply put a URL that links to the, to the copyright terms under the NFTs, uh, under the description of the NFTs. Um, but there's really it's really not very clear whether how 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 binding that will be in a legal sense. Um, another way is to try and code that 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 copyright terms uh, into the metadata of the NFT itself. But again, there's some operational challenges there because how do you ensure that that every subsequent buyer is in fact bound by those terms and there's no a requirement for them to, to, for example, accept those terms upon purchase. And finally, another big issue in terms of copyright is that it's jurisdiction in nature. Every country has its own copyright laws and copyright laws differ. And your, your protection in copyright is really limited to, to, to the relevant jurisdiction that you're in. So if let's say I am a copyright owner in Singapore and I feel there's been an infringement of my copyright uh, in an NFT that, 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 has been trans that has been transacted in in another country, Am I able to enforce my copyright in the other country um, based on uh, the, the certain copyright terms that I intended to enforce? Um, and I think that question is not very clear because uh, I, I think the reality is that copyright law has, is not really uh, ready or up to scratch to deal with issues like this now. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that, that basically the end of my presentation, uh, really just a flavor of, of, of the different issues that are out there. Uh, I'm happy to discuss in further detail during the Q&A later. Thanks a lot, Justin. Perfect. So you've put a lot of things on the table for us to consider legally. And my father used to always say, before you start any business, you've got to consult a lawyer and an accountant. So that's what we're saying here, Justin, right? Absolutely. 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 I mean, and, 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 yeah, you know, even more so given that the, all the uncertainty that, that, that is out there right now. So true. All right. Thanks a lot, Justin. And let's turn it over to Broderick now. So Broderick, come on up here and join me on the stage. And so Broderick. Hey, how's it going? So good to see you here. Uh, Broderick has been a, is a strategist at Bridges Studio and he's also a fund manager at a, at a venture which is between Bybit and BitDAO. These are organizations that uh, help with uh, cryptocurrency and more. And he's also a co-founder of Mission DAO, looking to use these NFTs and these technologies to help fund, uh, you know, ways to help people. So that's pretty interesting. And I asked him, well, why are you passionate about this topic? He said, look, we stand at the brink of the next chapter of human connectivity. I think that's really interesting and, and, and a way for us to think about this as well. Or early. And so he said to all to us and all of you too that he'd like to make his mark on it. And I hope that as you hear from him, you'll be able to think about, maybe I've learned some new things. So I know more, I can decide what to do. And then maybe you'll take action to make your own mark on this history too. So Broderick, over to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome, thanks Prof. All right, can I, can I get the slide up uh, right now? Hello everybody, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Broderick. Uh, in the metaverse, right? Uh, on Twitter, I'm known as Taco Cat. So uh, some people who are here, you guys would know me as Taco Cat and uh, still waiting on the slides. So once the slides are up and ready, we could we could rumble. Um, okay. I don't have your slides, but uh, uh, I don't know. I think Getty have it. Otherwise, I, I, could, I could totally just share my own slide. There's no, yeah. there's no issues with that. Yeah. Let me just pull it out then. Just a moment. Um, Yeti, are you around? Because uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. You want me to share the screen? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, because you have the disclaimer. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, no problem. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time to be here. Uh, I just recovered from COVID, so I will be coughing intermittently and uh, just want to apologize uh, for uh, about that first. So quick, quick uh, summary. This is who I am. This is what I do. Uh, I do a lot of uh, strategy. Um, I launch NFT projects. I work with creators. I work with companies. Uh, I help them get onto the metaverse. I help them get onto the NFT space. I think there's a lot more to be said about uh, the metaverse. Uh, sorry, I've got to start my timer. I don't want to overrun. Um, yeah, there's a lot more to be said about the metaverse. There's a lot more to be said about this space. And I think we could have a very hearty debate later. Um, but yeah, so I, I just want to take some time to talk about NFTs and the, bliss, the business application of NFTs. Uh, in recent time, uh, especially with the businesses that I consulted with, I am very passionate about getting real utility into this NFT rather, rather than it's just being like digital land that you could stay in. I mean, all that is great, but um, I think Prof. Keith and I will agree that the metaverse as a playable metaverse is something that is just not that ready yet. So I just I do want to use um, NFT as, as a business application. So you will see a little bit more later. I'll show you some examples of uh, some of the projects that have business application. Um, and uh, you would, I hope that, you know, as I share this, you, you, will, you will be able to get some ideas right, about how you could implement uh, NFTs into your business structure or to use NFTs to, you know, raise funds or to do certain access or to do, you know, to, to use it for certain tools and stuff like that. So um, you'll hear a little bit more from me uh, about that later. So just run through very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So quick disclaimer. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> okay, this is the scope. I'm just going to show you all the different types of NFTs. Uh, their use cases that is relevant right now. And uh, maybe you could get a great idea. Uh, recently, I just bought a car, right? Uh, I just bought a car recently and uh, I went to bid for, for my um, car plate number. Of course, you know, in vain, right? On, when I bid for the car plate number, I realized I was talking to my brother about this. And uh, he was telling me that, hey, if you bid for the car plate number, you could, you know, use it for your next car and your next car, and your next car, and you will always have this number, and this number will always be, you know, the number that, you know, you could use, and I'm like, oh, cool, I want, I don't know, five seven five seven seven five seven five something like that, right, so I went to bid, and it cost me a thousand dollars, and I'm like, and I, and I got it, so I thought, wow, this is a car plate that I can hand down to the next generation, in fact, this is the car, this car plate, right, is one of a kind, right, it is mine, and it's tied to my identity, and I, and I spoke to my brother and he, he told me, uh, if you want to sell this car plate, you can sell it on the secondary market. I'm like, what? There's a secondary market for car plates in Singapore? And I was like, yeah, if you want to buy number eight or you want to buy number 88 or 888, that will cost you a lot of money. I'm like, whoa, car plates in Singapore, they're like NFTs, you know, like it's unique, it's special, it's, in, it's, not, um, it's not exchangeable, you know, it's something that is one of one. So um, let's go next slide. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about fungibility and non-fungibility. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, we could talk a, little, a lot more than that, right? So what is a non-fungible token? It is a big word. It is a buzzword and everybody are using NFT, NFT, NFT. And recently I heard a speaker and uh, he, was, he used NFT. He said he used NFT as if NFT is something that is uh, not tangible, right? So he used it, he, he mistaked the word fungibility with tangibility and that was a bit weird, right? So uh, there, are, there are a lot of people in this space and they are super new. So you want to be very careful who you listen to. Um, so let's talk about fungibility. The idea of fungibility is that uh, something is exchangeable or it is mutually like uh, interchangeable. So for example, I have $10, right? I have 10 Singapore dollars. My $10 is the same as your $10, meaning that my $10 have the same value as your $10 if we were exchange at $10, nothing would change because my $10 is equal to your $10 and my $50 is equal to your $50. So in similar fashion, gold is the same. Why one kilogram of gold is equal to one kilogram of gold. Similarly for oil, one, one gallon of oil is one gallon of oil. Similarly for all the, com all the commodities that we trade. So if you look at the middle section on the top, that is my bank balance, right? <laughs> uh, and that is... And that is <coughs> Sorry, that, that is a digital asset which indicate the dollar, which is fungible, meaning that I could send you a dollar, I could send you $10,000 and it will go to your account as $10,000. There's no change. It is interchangeable. 
it is mutually exchangeable. There's nothing special about it. Similarly with the stocks that we hold, right? One Tesla equals to one Tesla. Of course, they're going through a stock split soon. But, you know, one 10 cent stock will be equal to one 10 cent stock. One DBS stock will be equal to one DBS stock. It's mutually exchangeable. Let's talk about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, most, of, most cryptocurrency are fungible in nature. Like Bitcoin is fungible. One Bitcoin is equal to one Bitcoin, right? Um, one Ethereum is equal to one Ethereum. One USDC is equal to one USDC. One XSGD is equal to one XSGD. It is mutually exchangeable. And uh, that is the whole idea of fungibility that something, this thing is exchangeable. But let's talk about something that is not fungible right now. I have with me two watches and they are the exact same watch, right? This is a Seiko 6309, right? I have two pieces. They are exactly the same, right? It's just that this is made in 1992 and this is made in 1963. Of course, this has so much more value. This goes for $400 on carousel and this goes for $200 on carousel. And, um, and the, the reason is because this is older, but they are actually the same thing. It's just that this is older and because it's older, it's more valuable. This is not fungible. One piece of 6309 is not equal to one piece of 6309. And this is unique from this. You know, I would like this better because um, this, is, this, this watch is made uh, on, on the same month that I was born in October of 1992. So I would like this more, but you know, I, I appreciate this more than this, but this costs a lot more. So it is not fungible, meaning that it's not exchangeable. There's no two things that are the same. Even if you buy a Rolex today and they all look the same, right? It is not the same because you could wear a Rolex and you can ding it up and you can have all the different scratches on it. Um, and my Rolex could be sitting in the safe and it will be in pristine, mint condition. Comes the day that we want to sell it, mine will be worth so much more than yours. Why? Because it's not fungible. It's not exchangeable. Similarly for art. Similarly for uh, HDB, right? I stay at level two. Apparently, according to HDB, my house is worth a lot less than someone who stays at level 16, right? And we will think, yeah, of course, you know, because of the utility, which is something that we'll talk about later. So non-fungible digital assets include a Fortnite skin or, you know, a, a gun buddy. Uh, and in the blockchain world, you know, these are your NFTs, as you see, you know, cool cats, CryptoPunks, uh, BAYC. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. <coughs> so we're going to move forward a little bit faster because of time. Uh, this is NFT as art, right? So if you're an artist here, this might be something that might interest you, right? So uh, Damien Hurst, he is, in my opinion, one of the greatest living artists uh, still alive. And he created this artwork called Currency. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that um, it's very interesting the way that Damien has um, organized this thing, right? He said, he said um, <clears throat> we have a digital version, which is the blockchain version, which is the NFT. And then I have a physical version. But here's the deal. Uh, when July comes about, right? July is just around the corner, just 100 over days away. He said, you have to make a decision, right? You have to decide between keeping the digital version, which is the NFT, or keeping the physical version. If you keep the digital version, I will shred the physical version. If you keep the physical version, I will destroy the digital version. Or you have to destroy the digital version in order to get a physical version. So right now, just out of curiosity, uh, would you hop onto the chat right now and just let us know, right? Just put it in the chat, say, would you keep the digital version or would you keep the physical version? Because this is the whole concept of the metaverse and the NFTs. And how something is of value. Is it valuable because it is physical? Or is it valuable because it is digital? Yeah, I don't know if they can put in a chat, but if they can't, no worries about it. Oh, they're putting in the q and I'm so sorry. <coughs> I'm so sorry about the people answering questions. But um, yeah, so this is Damien Hurst. And this is art. And this art, it transacts for $16,000. And why does it transact for $16,000 right now? Because it's Damien Hurst. Because Damien Hurst is a well-known artist and he could command this kind of price for the art that he wants to sell. So as an artist, how much can you command really depends on the artist that you are. If you're a Picasso or if you're a Banksy, you get to sell your art at 2 million, 3 million, right? If you're people, you can get sell it at 69 million, right? So art, it's something, you know, in the NFT world, but it gets more interesting. So let's, let's go to the next slide. This is Basi, this is BAYC, this is what we call digital identity, 
right? Digital identity is the way, is the thing that represent you in this digital world, in this metaverse, right? Um, a bought at your cup, this transact at 100 Ethereum, that is 400,000 Singapore dollars. $400,000 Singapore dollars for a profile picture. And the question is, why don't you just right click and save that picture? And I can answer that question very, very quickly uh, by showing you the next slide. Because with the bought it, um, <clears throat> with the bought it NFT, if you bought this bought it NFT a couple months ago, you will receive eight coins. Man, this is a soft spot for me because I wanted to buy a BAYC right before they dropped the eight coin, right? And when they dropped the eight coin, people sold the eight coin for $150,000, just like that. Boom, $150,000 profit. You can only get the eight coin if you have a bought eight. And this eight coin is then used for their governance and used for the utility, used to buy things. Uh, you get bought eight chemistry club, right? That's a valve that you see right there, that valve. It goes for 35 Ethereum. That's $100,000 again. You get bought eight kernel club, right? These are things that you kind of collect over the months um, if you own a bought eight from the beginning. But if you just save the image, you get none of this, right? You get none of this. And uh, more than that, you get a lot of other things, right? You get a gated membership access meaning that you get to be in this little country club in this court that is gated. Nobody else can come, that come in. You can do business inside. You know, you can chat with people inside. You can hang out with the rich and famous inside. Uh, you get early access to a lot of other projects. You know, you get early access to Yuga's, Yuga Lab Future product, like something that they're doing with Animoca. Um, this is collector own IP, so you can actually, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about the law thing, you know, because I'm not the expert. But what you can actually do with your body is that you can license it out for movies, you can license it out for comic books, you can put it as the storefront of your cafe if you want to do a bought it cafe. You know, uh, you get early access to merch. I'm sorry, I spelled that wrongly. And very importantly, uh, for cloud, back when I was doing business, back in the days, back in the days, right? Uh, what, how do we show people, right? This is like flex, right? How do we show people that we are capable? Right. How do we show people that we are capable? Um, you know, we, we, we wear a Patek fillet, we wear our Hugo Boss, and we have our Mont Blanc cufflinks and our Mont Blanc pants where people would sign. And when people look at us, they're like, hey, this guy, he made it. He got the Patek fillet, right? But it's very, very different right now because like, who cares if I wear a Hugo Boss suit, right? Uh, because my digital identity is the thing that gives me allowance to make, to, to make business decisions. Right, to influence and people look at me and say, hey, that guy's a body, right? So he must be rich. He must know what's going on. So through that, <clears throat> through that, uh, people have cloud and they, they use this as their flex. Um, so let's move on, digital identity. All right, this is gaming. X Infinity just got hacked a few days ago, $600 billion. So next slide. Um, what happened is that with this Xe, this little creature right here, you could play games. And you could earn some tokens and this token then can be sold for cash. So this is a play to earn gaming NFT. This is something that's quite popular. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see that these are the other games that are coming up. Galaxy Fight Club, uh, Chumbi Valley, Illuvium, um, Cypher. So these are the new and upcoming gaming NFTs that will be, you know, showing up in the next few months. They're going to get real, you know, this, these are the games. Similar concept, you play the game, you earn some tokens, you change your token for cash. Right, so that is the whole concept of NFT gaming. Uh, you could use that token to buy and upgrade your characters if you're into that. But uh, most people will just play, make the money and get out. Right, so uh, next slide. Oh, this is cool, right? This is something that we recently invested in. Uh, this is Origin NFT. This is Origin NFT. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see what, they, what it gives you. Right, it gives you membership access to alphas. Alphas meaning like, what are the insiders buying right now? You know, what is the popular project right now? Uh, if you have access to business where you can chat with different people, you get early access to other projects, you get to buy the pre-IPO version, if that makes sense, right? pre-IPO version, the early access to other projects. Uh, you get an alpha channel for Eve where you can chat about, you know, things that are happening. Uh, but more impressively, right, what they have is actually they have this really incredible and powerful analytic tool that you can only access if you have the NFT. So if you could jump to the next slide, you could generate slides like this. You just type in something, you type in a code and boom, it generates this for you. And this is really, really good for market analysis, right? You will be able to look at this and you'll be able to make good business decision on whether you should buy the NFT, should not buy the NFT, feel the hype, understand the ground. And uh, with buying this Origins NFT, you are able to then, you know, 
make better NFT trading decisions. Uh, next slide. So this is physical access. I can't talk too much about it. Currently, it's uh, a project I'm working on. Uh, but what happened is that if you own this NFT, you get access to an ultra lounge somewhere in the exclusive part of Singapore. And uh, without the NFT, you just can't go in. You just can't go into this ultra lounge. And uh, you have to pay a cover fee if you want to get into this ultra lounge. But if you have the NFT, you just go in for free, right? Uh, it, this NFT will also passively generate a token that you could use for FMB, room bookings, your cover fee for your other guests. Uh, if you're a high level holder of this NFT and get great physical access, you get exclusive physical content like rare whiskey and cigars and VIP room access. So this is something that is upcoming, a real world utility of the NFT. So next slide. <clears throat> Adidas did a physical approach, meaning that um, if you buy the Adidas NFT, you get access to their physical merch in 2022. So all these are limited edition. Of course, if you understand the hype market, you know that these hoodies and these tracksuit will sell for thousands of dollars. It's insane, right? Uh, you also get some digital access as well that Adidas is doing. So this is another form of NFT that you could create. So next slide, I think uh, we are very close to our last one. Uh, next one. And Mission Dao Philanthropy. So next slide. Uh, Mission DAO is a decentralized and transparent mission giving fund. So what it does is that when people buy the NFT, the money go into a wallet. And from this wallet, it is then distributed in a transparent manner to our mission partner all around the world. So it, the NFT also double up as a DAO governance token, meaning that hey, you know, people could vote on like, hey, should we be giving to this organization? Hey, let's bring up this conversation. Let's give to this organization. Let's you know give this amount to this, com uh, this organization. It's like a big pool of money that people put into and then it kind of like distributes. So NFT could be used for philanthropy as well. So I think that is the end of my conversation. Let's connect. So before I go, just one last thought. Uh, I just want to say that that you are an NFT, right? I, I, I know it sounds a bit weird. It sounds a bit cliche, but I want to say that you are an NFT. You are some, you're unique, you're special. You know, uh, if you're listening here, in here today, you have a unique utility in this world. Right, and you're placed in this world for a reason. You're created and you're placed in this world. You're attending this talk for a reason. There's something that you can bring to the future of humanity that nobody else can bring. And there is a utility that you can bring. And um, yeah, there is so much potential in this space of NFT. I hope that you're thinking about how can I apply this in my businesses. And there's incredible potential in you. You are you, you the NFT, right? Uh, and you, I, I hope that you're thinking about what are the things that I can bring to this world? What are the potential that I can then articulate to this world. So uh, with that, Prof Keith, uh overrun a little bit. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Very good, Broderick. Fantastic uh, perspective. Uh, you've opened up the door wide open for all of us, right, to see this. Now we want to show you how you can actually hop in and do some of this. So we've gotten to know. Man, I hope you've gotten to hear some new things, new considerations. Broader has brought us to a decision point. I like that you're an NFT. So yeah, what are you going to do about this? Vic, we're joined by a student from the National University of Singapore and Vignesh. And he's going to be walking you through how you can actually set up your own NFT. So let's welcome Vignesh here. And he's also an intern in our NUS FinTech lab, which is where we share all about experiential education and this is one of the ways that you can experience it. So Vignesh, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Prof Keith and uh, Mr. Broderick for sharing on NFTs. So I'll be presenting how to mint NFTs. Oh, just give me a second. All right, great. So uh, just to preface this, let me give you some general information. So Web3 wallets are denoted with an address, which is typically with an O zero X attached in front of it. So wallet providers like MetaMask help you manage your tokens or NFTs and you can track your transactions that you perform there. Lastly, there are NFT marketplaces, are places where you can buy and sell NFTs for money. For example, OpenSea that runs on the Ethereum network, where NFTs are also transacted on the Ethereum network. For today, what we'll be doing is we'll be using a test network to simulate the process of minting NFTs. We'll be minting NFTs on the Ring B test network, and we'll be using OpenSea, the test net edition. So this requires some money, but using a testnet, you can always go to a faucet and get some free tokens for you to test this out yourself. If you want to mint this, the first thing you'll need to do is set up the MetaMask Chrome extension. And to see the NFTs, you will need MetaMask mobile application. So do try and install both later on. So this is a test account private key that I'll be using. 
So just give me a second. I'm just demonstrate this. As you can see, that I've already set up my MetaMask account here. Uh, so it will look something like this. And as you can see over here, we have the Ring Vtest network. So just type it all in. All right, so once I log in, I click on this, I select show or hide test networks. So this will bring up this list of test networks and I select the ring B test network from here. From here, let's go to testnets.openc.io. So what I can do is I click on this icon here and I click on MetaMask. This will log me into this testnet wallet right here. So now let's walk through the creation of an NFT. So hit create. So this will bring up a contract. Just sign the contract. Following which you'll get this, these few fields. First thing you do, select a JPEG image or a video of your choice. Uh, just give me a second. All right, I'm just gonna pick this random image that I have. So what I'm gonna call this is I'm gonna call this MS Excel Data Analytics. So this is just the name of my NFT. You can put other links, including link to your portfolio or your website, and you can provide a description. So this one is just the image of Data Analytics in Excel. Select the collection that you wanna to deploy to. In this case, you have sample connect collection from NUS FinTech. You can also add other properties, levels, stats, and you can even create unlockable content. So we'll be just minting one of these NFTs. So go down here, select that I'll be minting to the Ring B network. So you can also choose to select from the Polygon network Mumbai or Baobao. So we'll be using Ring B. Hit create. And there we have it, we have an NFT. So now I'm gonna demonstrate how, how you can import these NFTs through your mobile application. All right, so what we do is we first go to MetaMask, the MetaMask application on our phone, hit NFTs, hit import NFT, and then we can paste the token address that we can find right here. Sorry, second. As you can see, when I click on, this particular NFT and click on details, there's a contract address and a token ID. So we'll be using both of these in minting it. So if I click on this, it opens another tab which gives us a contract address. So copy from here and then paste it. Into the import NFT address portion. All right. So the next thing we want to do is we want to copy the token ID from down here. So copy that. And then what we can do is we can paste the token ID into the ID selection. And then there's just one final step. Just hit import. And then you should be able to see the NFT that you minted within your account. So this was a video recording of a previous NFT that I made, but yeah, this tutorial should work for you to mint your own NFT and get started on your own NFT collection. Hope that helps. Thank you, Prof Keith. <laughs> Vignesh, fantastic. Thank you very much. And we'll have those slides up on the NUS FinTech Lab site uh, so that, that way you can try this out on your own too. Uh, of course, though, make sure, as my father had said, that you check out with a lawyer and accountant first before you try any of these things. That's a big disclaimer we want to make sure is right there. Vignesh, really appreciate you sharing this and walking through. And I hope you all, that was really quick, right? You had just a few steps just to create that NFT. But what Broderick has shared with us is that you need a bigger picture as well. You really need to think about your community and everything else 